Hello. Hello. Last Hi, night. Mary. All right. So welcome everyone to the New International Bookshops talk, Workers Inquiry and Global Class Struggle, Strategies, Tactics, Objectives. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, the Kulin Nations people, and pay respect to their elders past and present. So in Australia, happy May Day, and thank you to our two speakers for joining us from America and South Africa. I'm Maddie, and I'm from NIMS, we're an independent, not-for-profit, radical left bookshop in Melbourne. Thank you to the Search Foundation for co-hosting with us. So after our speakers talk, there will be some time for question, and I will call on you one by one. Robert Overts is a lecturer in political science at San Jose State University. He is a, the author of When Workers Shot Back, Class Conflict from 1877 to 1921, and is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Labor and Society. Sean Hetting is based in Cape Town, South Africa. He works as a research and education officer at the International Labor Research and Information Group. Hetting has written numerous articles for South African and international activist websites and publications, covering issues such as the capitalist crisis, new forms of worker organizing and anarchism. He has also been involved in a number of activist organizations in South Africa. So welcome, Sean and Robert, and I'll pass over to you now. Thank you, Maddie and Nibs for having us. If you can give me just a moment, I'm gonna share something with everyone. So happy May Day, everyone in Australia. We've still got a few hours in the United States until, until we get to this incredible day. So it's a great day to be talking about international workers' movements and class struggle. And um, I want to um, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, the focus of the book that I edited and put together um, that Sean also with uh, his co-writer contributed to. Uh, and that's workers inquiring global class struggle. So I'm going to talk about the focus of this book, which is on class composition theory and workers inquiry. And I want to I want to start with this observation, and I think I think we could relate across the three continents uh, that we that we're joining together through the through this uh, telecommunications tool. And that is that the international working class has a problem. We're we're getting our asses kicked in many different ways. The the evidence is is overwhelming that um, uh, worker organizing, traditional unionization, strikes and collective bargaining have led to overwhelming uh, and repeated defeats in many different ways around the world. In many countries, we find a, a kind of commonality. Um, we find that union density has dropped significantly, the number of workers belonging to unions, uh, that strikes are at a historical low point, um, that unions are overwhelmingly harnessed to neoliberal parties of the left and the center, um, and that uh, unions increasingly just focus on uh, bargaining over wages and benefits. And with that, they ignore work itself and the power that workers have in the workplace while they're at work. And of course, what another thing that we find is this abandonment of, of traditional strategies. Um, we see advocacy and the focus on grieving and mobilizing uh, workers and allies um, and servicing the members of the union uh, have replaced uh, worker organizing in the workplace. Um, oh, sorry, I went, to, I went backwards. Um, and, and along with this, the strategy of conflict and disruption have been replaced by interest-based bargaining and non-zero-sum games and bargaining for the common good. These are, these are terms that are widely used um, among unions um, in the United States and in, in a few other places around the world. And yet, despite all these signs that um, organized labor and the labor movement and unions um, are in decline, we still see workers self-organizing. 
Um, we've seen uh, an explosion of wildcat strikes, particularly in the United States and a number of other places in the early months of the pandemic. Uh, and we see also uh, workers organizing at key junctures, uh, engaging in disrupting global supply chains. This is becoming more widespread, ironically, at the same time that these other indicators show that the working class um, is uh, being defeated using these traditional union models. So what, what motivated me to put this book together and connect with all these different people who are working on thinking of new tactics and strategies around the world, like Sean, um, is that we need to really construct um, a, a global workers inquiry. We really need to rethink our tactics and strategies. And so what I'm gonna talk about briefly is what are workers inquiry and, and what does this have to do with class composition theory? Um, in this journal that no longer exists from, the, um, from a, a, a left uh, uh, organization of economists uh, called Common Sense, uh, was this unusual piece that was published several decades back uh, by uh, Ed Emery. And Ed Emery called for um, no politics without workers' inquiry. And I wanna, I wanna share a couple of passages from his call for engaging in, in essentially what the book is attempting to add to, and that is uh, constructing a, a, worker, a global workers' inquiry. Ed Emery wrote that the enemy constantly studies class composition in order to fracture it, to break it, disperse it, and permanently dissipate its strength. We, for our part, study class composition in order to strengthen it, consolidate it, and turn it into a real basis of power. And at the moment, we know just about fuck all. In other words, we're engaged in struggle without really understanding how the working class is composed. And so Ed Emery suggests that we have to muster all available forces to work on a militant class composition study project. This is to inform and to be the basis of possible future political organization. Before we can make politics, he says, we have to understand that, cl that class composition. This requires us to study it, to analyze it, and we do this through a process of inquiry. Hence, no politics without inquiry. So Ed Emery wrote this over a quarter of a century uh, ago. Um, and others have heard this call, folks like Notes from Below and other, other contributors to, uh, to the book. Um, attempting to carry out using class composition theory and understanding of the current class composition of the working class to inform our tactics and strategies. So what exactly does this book cover? Um, it covers uh, examples of workers' inquiries of different elements of a workers' inquiry that I'll be talking about uh, from nine different countries located on three continents, uh, which contain about half the world's population. So it covers a broad expanse of, uh, of, of the global working class. And I'm just gonna run through what the different chapters cover. Sean's gonna talk more about this in a few minutes, but uh, we have uh, Sean um, and uh, his co-authors chapter on contingent miners and surface workers in South Africa. There's a chapter on contingent factory workers and state responses um, in China. Um, a, a chapter on contingent auto workers in India, public school teachers in Mexico, logistics warehouse workers in Italy, and truckers and logistic workers in Argentina. Um, I contributed a chapter on uh, strike threats by university professors in the United States, and then a transport logistic workers chapter um, from Turkey, as well as a, a chapter on several different sectors in the UK, including gamers, platform workers, call center workers, retail, and cleaners. So we, I, I put together these different chapters as an attempt to try to see if we could start building a kind of global understanding of where the working class is in these different sectors and different countries and see how class struggle is developing in these different countries and then circulating across these different sectors and borders. So the, the reality is that looking at where the global working class currently stands is, is it leads us to this to this first step, the understanding that we need to develop new tactics and strategies because many of the ones that we're already using are not working, they're failing. And the indicators are, 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 are pretty, pretty vibrant. Um, wealth inequality and the growth of these super corporate, global corporations, um, the weakness of workers in the workplace. And as I talked about before, and the weakness of the union sector. So in order to develop new tactics and strategies, 
we can rely on something called class composition, understanding the class composition, relying on class composition theory. So in carrying out workers inquiry, class composition is the basis for the theory understanding how the working class is organized, how capital is organized, and then the what I call a, a, a kind of spiral dance between capital and the working class and how the class composition changes uh, through these different cycles of struggle. And then the workers inquiry itself is the method. So understanding the class composition, that's the theory. The workers inquiry is the method for understanding the current situation um, and where the working class stands uh, in the class struggle today. So there's essentially three objectives um, that uh, we try to get out in the book uh, of, of understanding that relationship between class composition theory and workers' inquiry. So the first is uh, to use workers' inquiry to understand the technical composition of capital. What's the technical composition of capital? That is essentially capital's current strategy for imposing work. Um, how does capital actually do this? What are the means by which capital is currently organized and why does it organize in that way in order to restore control and impose work on workers. So we ask the questions of what's capital's current strategy, how is work organized, what's the division of labor, and what's the current management strategy for involving the use and integrating the use of technology, using the wage, insourcing, outsourcing, etc. small typo in there, and also what's the relationship as well between the unwage sector and the wage sector. So understanding, the first step is understanding that technical composition of understanding the adversary. How is capital organized? And how is that organization the result of its response to the last cycle of class conflict? And also very importantly is how is the global supply chain organized? How is capital developed and expanded uh, an integrated global supply chain in order to escape and to move in a direction away from where the working class succeeded in disrupting production in the last cycle. And so by understanding that global supply chain, the next step is to understand where the choke points are. And here uh, we can draw on the work of Jake Wilson and Manny Ness in their recent book on uh, choke points. Uh, where can working class organization apply pressure and leverage to disrupt global production? So the second element of a global workers' inquiry is to use workers' inquiry to understand the existing composition of the working class. So how is the working class currently composed? How is it currently organized? What are the different sectors uh, and internal divisions? And these, the current organization of the working class is really the aftermath of, cap, of the implementation of capital's strategy in response to the last cycle of struggle. So how is capital strategy how has it decomposed the working class power during that last cycle of struggle? And it also asks us to look at how workers are organized by race, by gender, reproductive labor, unwaged and waged labor. Of course, the, the nature of the exploitation of labor is based on the exploitation of unwaged labor, both of the waged worker and unwaged worker, in this what we can call the social factory. And then by understanding the current composition of the working class, we can also get at how workers are attempting to organize themselves in different ways. What are the different tactics and strategies that are emerging from below? And I think Sean's gonna get at this because they're, I think one of the most fascinating examples in recent years of that self-organization of, of workers and developing new tactics and strategies we can see uh, among miners in South Africa. So we refer to this as the recomposition of working class power. So how are workers using new tactics and strategies to recompose their power? And from that, what are those new tactics and strategies and how can we circulate them and learn from them and apply them in, in, in different places? So the third element of workers inquiry that we get out in the book is to identify these new tactics and strategies that workers are using and use them to help recompose our class power both across different sectors even different employers and different sectors within and across different countries along that global supply chain. So we ask these questions of what tactics and strategies work under the current technical composition of capital. So if capital's technical composition is a response to that previous cycle of working class struggle, what are the tactics and strategies that we need to 
respond to that and move to that next layer of that spiral dance to that next level. So which, and it also requires asking the question and finding out which workers are strategically, strategically positioned at key choke points in that global supply chain. That's where um, even pressure by a small number of workers can have uh, global ramifications. And how can that struggle be circulated across workplaces, sectors, and borders? So how can we overcome those divisions of nationality, of race, and class? How is struggle carried by workers who are migrant uh, moving between within a particular nation state and across different nation states. Now, sometimes there's some confusion about what workers' inquiries are. Um, sometimes people, uh, when they first find out about a workers' inquiry, they ask, well, isn't this just a survey? Or isn't this just the kind of survey that unions often do when they go into, into collective bargaining? And the answer is no. A workers' inquiry is not a survey. It can be used and misused or reduced in its, in its potential capacity as this important tool as a survey, but it's not a survey in itself. Workers' inquiries are not just these kind of workplace surveys that unions do to prepare for bargaining. They're not used in just single isolated workplaces, although um, one of the chapters is a good example of uh, an inquiry that was done in single workplaces, but they're not limited just to uh, being carried out in a single workplace. They're not a, a tactic that um, a vanguardist group might use if they salt the workplace. This is a term we use in the United States for people who go to work in a certain workplace in order to organize it. And it's not what um, prominent US uh, labor strategist Jane McAlevey calls a structure test. Although it can help us do a structure test, it isn't a structure test itself because it's not just for the purposes of bargaining, it's for recomposing the power of the working class. And it's not just an academic exercise, even though these workers inquiry appear in this book, they're intended to help share the different tactics and strategies that we learn from understanding the current class composition so that others can take it up and, and discover tactics and strategies that work where they are. So workers inquiries are used to understand the current class composition to assess capital's power and strategy to, to bring this back together in order to inform tactics, strategies, and objectives. And that would help us understand our potential to disrupt and to transcend capitalism. And that's what makes a worker's inquiry different than just being a, a tool such as a survey that can help uh, a particular union in a new round of bargaining. Ultimately, a worker's inquiry is not just about gaining short-term concessions, although that's important for the long-term uh, trajectory of a struggle, but it's ultimately for getting past capitalism. So um, I'm gonna stop here um, and uh, turn it over to Sean. Right, um, yeah, thanks to, to Robert and Maddie for the invite. Um, yeah, so um, I work at an organization called ILRIG um, in South Africa. Um, if, if comrades want to see some of our work, uh, we have a website, ilrigsa.org.za, or you can visit our Facebook page, which is ILRIG SA. Um, the chapter that we focused on with my colleague, Dale McKinney, um, specifically looked at the struggle of, there were two specific struggles we looked at. One was in the platinum mine worker sector in South Africa, and the other one is on the East Rand of Johannesburg, which traditionally was an industrial area, but largely now it's wholesaling. It still has some industries. Um, so these were two really important sectors. One is because the platinum mine sector, well, the platinum sector is one of the most important sectors in the country now, it's overtaking gold. Um, and the second, the, the example of Johannesburg is, it's a large industrial area, it's an important area for the economy of South Africa. Um, now, what we really focused on was two experiments um, by workers. Um, Robert was mentioning how the, the, the working class has been restructured. Um, so in South Africa, what you find is it's mainly precarious workers that are now the dominant workers in the economy. It's mainly outsourced workers, labor broker workers. So we looked at an experience, two experience of these workers where they began self-organizing. Um, 
in the platinum belt, they started setting up mass assemblies where they would democratically, very based on di direct democracy, decide on actions they're going to take. And they set up worker committees between 2009 and 2013. Um, and then the except second example is in Johannesburg. It's called the Simonier Workers Forum, where precarious workers, outsourced workers, casual workers, contract workers, set up a forum and councils in different workplaces um, outside of trade unions to essentially take their struggles forward, one, to become permanent, but two, to improve wages. So that's really what I'm really looking at tonight. Um, I'll give some of the background on why they elected to go outside of trade unions. Um, so some of it will be political, some of it's practical, but linked to the politics. And then I will discuss kind of the challenges that they face. I think as Robert said, um, in class struggles, things don't stand still. So the states um, and companies have tried to undermine these things and often through extreme violence. And I'll get to some of that as we go along. Um, so as I said, it's it's the experience of these two groups or large groups of workers that, that have undertook struggles in recent years. And they, they use very innovative tactics, wildcat strikes, sit-ins. Um, so in order to understand why they took this the route they did, um, it's important to kind of just give a background on where trade unions have gone in South Africa and, and some of the reasons. So um, I'm sure comrades would know South Africa has a long history of a radical trade unionism um, from the 70s and into the 80s. Um, unfortunately, today, the unions are a shadow of their former selves. Um, some of it relates to the political choices that they took. Um, Robert mentioned how unions are tied to neoliberal parties. That is largely the case in South Africa. Um, in our case, they tied now to the African National Congress, which was the liberation movement, but now is the main um, implement of neoliberalism um, that really began in the 80s and it had major consequences for how the unions themselves were structured. Um, so there was a long tradition in South Africa of worker controlled unions um, based a lot around direct democracy, direct action. Um, but a political choice was taken in the late 80s and it really played itself in the 90s, it played itself in the 90s. So the biggest union federation in the late 80s decided to align itself with the ANC and then the South African Communist Party. Even at that point, it started having implications because some of the traditions, certainly of the Communist Party, were then drawn into the unions. Um, so the unions gradually changed in that sense from a bottom-up structure to a top-down structure. Leadership began gaining more and more power. Um, and that was even quite early on. Um, but the real, the real change, and specifically a marked change, comes in 1994. Um, so once Kasatu decided to align with the ANC, and there was a transition in South Africa at the end of apartheid, obviously the ANC becomes the governing party. Many of the leadership in the unions had joined the ANC or SACP and moved into parliament. Um, those that remained started demanding salaries that were equivalent to parliamentarians. So you had a stratification between officials in South Africa and members. Um, Robert also touched on this where there was a political choice at the time where the unions essentially at least stopped saying that they were seeking a revolution and started going more into social dialogue. The thinking at the time was because your alliance partners in the state you have a better chance of entering into these institutions of social dialogue um, with specialists. So you have a lot of specialists being hired at the time in unions to negotiate within these forums. Um, an idea was supposedly that through the social dialogue and structures, you would be able to influence the direction of economic policies um, within South Africa. That turned out not to be the case. Um, specifically the state and, and corporations in these social dialogues tended to block any union initiatives. Um, but the, the end result was the unions became more and, be, more and more bureaucratized as you had more specialists trying to influence these spaces of social dialogue. Um, and similarly, uh, there was a reliance on, it became a reliance on centralized bargaining, with specialized bargainers um, trying to negotiate four, five, six year deals on wages. Um, 
and it took away the power workers had on the shop floor um, and it started wage negotiations started happening essentially in boardrooms um so that was kind of a decline that you saw in the 90s and through to the 2000s um one thing that became very practical was that once this was happening um Unions needed resources to ensure the salaries of various officials and these specialized negotiators. Um, and as the working class became restructured in South Africa, which was a tactic by capital um, to try and maintain profits, essentially starting even back in the 80s, um, you have the rise of a whole layer of outsourced labor broker workers um, and a fragmentation of the working class. Um, and unfortunately, the unions didn't respond to this. They kept on, and they still do, focusing on permanent workers, which are actually declining. They're a minority of workers now in South Africa. But the reason was you needed the subscriptions to maintain the salaries of officials. So it doesn't pay if you're a traditional union, traditional in terms of South Africa over the recent period of 10, 15 years or 20 years. It doesn't pay to recruit those precarious workers. Um, often they'll be in work for three months and then they disappear and they might get a contract again in six months time, but it doesn't pay the union. So you see a whole shift of union and unions in South Africa where they've shrunk in the private sector quite dramatically. And now most of the unions, the big unions like Nahawu, um, are in the public sector where there's more permanent workers. Um, so there's a whole shift in and even the demo, demographics of unions in South Africa away from private sector unions being the big unions to under certainly in the 70s and 80s to now state sector unions being the big unions um, because there's more permanent workers there. So what we saw and it was specifically, it started in 2009 um, and it was in the platinum sector, as I said, that's a highly important sector in South Africa. We started seeing quite interesting struggles taking place. It was mainly outsource workers or labor broker workers on the platinum mines started to organize themselves. Um, and this was basically done on ad hoc committees. Um, there are some stories from the time where workers would go down into shafts and they would simply start speaking to one another. And they began organizing and out of this between a period from about a year and a half from 2009 onwards, on six months, workers did sit-ins underground. Um, so they would go underground, were self-organized, and they would occupy the mine and then lay out various demands. The key demands that they had were higher wages, but they were also, because they were outsourced and precarious workers, their demands were to become permanent workers. Um, now, this was done completely outside of the main union in the mine workers sector, which is the National Union of Mine Workers. Um, and the reason was, that these workers felt that they couldn't trust the union. Um, the union had signed long-term deals where wages were, wage increases were not really above inflation. Um, and they'd also been in the sector when a process of casualization had taken place. Um, and in fact, once these sit-ins were happening, the union itself, which was the NUM, which was the largest union, became quite hostile towards them. Um, and, and, there seemed to be a fear amongst the union about the self-organizing. And there certainly was a fear amongst the actual mining companies. So once this was taking place, it started to become highly effective. So when you looked at what happened, the workers began winning a lot of their demands. Um, and these were supposedly workers that unions couldn't organize. They're supposedly unorganizable workers, yet they themselves could organize. Um, and through this organizing in these sit-ins and market strikes, they started winning their demands. Um, gradually, it wasn't, it wasn't like a strategy that was thought out, but gradually other mine workers began picking up on this. Um, and in 2012, a massive struggle took place um, in South Africa. It was the largest struggle that had been possibly in the country for honestly 60, 70 years. Um, it was an amazing struggle that took place. So at one of the biggest employees at um, in, employers um, in the mining sector, it was in called Impala Platinum in 2012. The workers themselves began doing the same thing. They began organizing in mass assemblies. Um, Again, it was outside of the NUM. Again, the demand was high wages. They wanted 9,000 rand a month. Um, 
the average wage wage was between four thousand five hundred and six thousand a month, and they began demanding that the the casual and the contract workers and the outsource workers become permanent workers at the mine itself. Um, and they undertook a massive struggle. Uh, there was wildcat strikes. The the union itself was condemning it. It was essentially siding with the with the companies. Um, but the workers actually won that struggle, and they won the nine thousand grand a month. Um, through the, the, the wildcat strike, through organizing, through direct democracy in mass, in mass meetings. Um, that then inspired workers at two other companies. One was Lonman. Um, there was a picture that Robert had there of a meeting um, of workers at Lonman, which is called Marikana. It was one of the mines. So they would meet in mass assemblies every single day, um, literally two, three, four thousand workers. Um, you would have a right to speak within the meeting. Um, the reason why they chose these large meetings as organizing forums is the management was forced to come to these meetings. So it wasn't like it was a deliberate tactic. They weren't, they didn't have representatives or shop stewards that would go and then negotiate and then come back and report. They said that management must come to the entire workers. The idea was no one could then sell out. Um, so if management has to come to the workers and talk to 4,000 workers, Though there's an interesting cartoon from the time, um, I should have actually had it, but um, it's like a skit. It was these mass workers meeting in the cartoon, um, and then management says, "We are the leaders," and then there's like a trip. We all leaders. Um, so that was really the tactics, and that that then spread to another mine called Amplatz. And over a period of about a year, there was organizing through these mass assemblies and working committees on the platinum mine. Um, it was effective. Um, they were wildcat strikes. So they also went out of the Labor Relations Act in South Africa, which actually, in many ways, it, it was a, a gain that, that, that law came in 1995. But in many ways, it turned out to be a curse as well, because it set a whole lot of requirements. Um, if you wanted to go and strike, you had to give notice. So. Uh, a company would have a long period where they can put in plans. In this case of the platinum sector, companies can do that. Uh, the workers just, when they decided to go on strike, they went on strike. Um, the strikes weren't protected, so it meant that they could be fired. But at the time, they had enough power to kind of stop that. There were attempts to fire them. Um, but essentially, through mass organizing, the companies couldn't quite pull it off. So over a period of a year, there was an amazing energy um, and it was an amazing time to actually be around. So um, you really got a sense that something was going to happen and something was going to change. Unfortunately, I think as yeah, Robert says, things don't stand still. So what the state did um, along with the current state president who it then was one of the shareholders in Longman, um, Sir Ramaphosa, He's, he used his connections to call in the police at one of the mines, um, which was Marikana. There, 34 mine workers were shot dead by the police. Um, some of them were assassinated at point blank range. And there was an attempt to break the strike. Um, but that state repression spread. Um, the state actually unleashed the military as well in surrounding townships where workers lived and their families lived. Um, there were curfews, there were a thousand troops at Marikana in the township. Um, but this happened across the Platinum Belt. So there was, it was also kind of a, a time where, yeah, it was, it was seriously dangerous to be an activist in some way it was under apartheid. So a lot of these worker activists were tortured, some of them, yeah, um, harassed. Um, the companies themselves eventually got to the point where they realized what a danger these these kind of committees were and this way of organizing was. Um, and they kept on saying, we're not going to, in the long run, recognize these committees. For a year, they were forced to. Um, but in the long run, the state said also, if you wanted to, to be recognized as workers, you needed to be in a union. The LRA in South Africa, which is the Labor Relations Act, stipulates how union would be structured. So it's quite a top-down thing. There must be an executive. And they were trying to push workers back into the unions. Um, the workers that for a while were able to resist this, but with state violence, um, and I think also an absence of really a long-term strategy that this could be a way of organizing the long-term amongst the large layer. There were some workers that had that vision, but it didn't go through to a large enough layer. Um, and 
with that and the state repression, workers gradually went back into a union. It wasn't the NUM, it was a rival union called AMCU, which is Amalgamated Mine Workers and Construction Workers Union. Um, so by 2013, it looked like this kind of thing had died. Um, it, the committees on the, the mines had disappeared. Um, and it looked like it was kind of maybe a one-off strategy or, or one-off occurrence that these things arose. Um, that soon became clear it actually wasn't. Um, in 2011, and this is the second example, um, an advice office was opened called the Casual Workers Advice Office in an industrial area on the east of Johannesburg, which is the main, I suppose, concentration of workers in South Africa is really around Johannesburg and on the east of, of the city. Um, it started targeting precarious workers, casual workers, um, contract workers, and it began first by providing popular education, but also legal assistance in any cases that went to the CCMA. I won't, if comrades want to know what the CCMA is, maybe I'll explain later um, if you want to know, but it's, it's basically a, a structure where if you fired, you would take your case there. Um, so they began doing this, and they specifically targeted the precarious workers. Um, a lot of them were in warehouses, um, because manufacturing in South Africa has declined, it still exists, but with neoliberalism machine and trade liberalization, a shift to warehousing and importation. So these workers then started meeting at the casual workers advice office, like literally hundreds of workers every second weekend to discuss the challenges they were facing as workers. But in particular, the main dominant form of workers, which is precarious work. Um, and out of this, they started developing tactics on how to take their struggles forward. And they decided in 2015, they wanted to have a structure, which was not a union, but they wanted it to be a workers forum. So the way it works is you could go to the casual workers advice office every second Saturday. You could join the meeting. Anyone could speak at the meeting. You would discuss the tactics you were going to use to try and win gains. One of the gains they were really trying to win is to become permanent workers employed um, at the company rather than through the contractors. Um, and there was a law that was passed coming out of Marikana that said um, contract workers had to be employed by the parent company after a three month period. Um, so they tried to use this law that was really won through the platinum workers strike to try and gain permanent employment and also to win higher wages. So there's been a whole lot of organizing that has been taking place there. Um, they then decided they were gonna form councils at each workplace. There's a couple, there's probably 150 to 200 workplaces that now meet workers from those workplaces in the Seminary Workers Forum. They decided that they wanted to form work councils at their workplaces that would negotiate with companies directly. So the workers wouldn't have shop stewards or officials, they would do the negotiation themselves. Um, that worked really well. So there was there was a, a number of gains. Workers were then employed permanently um, in many sectors actually coming out of this. So there was a lot won through the Seminary Workers Forum. But as Robert said, the kind of struggle doesn't stay constant. So bosses then found a way around the system. They would claim that whole sections of the the factory were outsourced. Um, and in South Africa, you're allowed to outsource, you're just not allowed to labor broker for more than three months, um, but you can outsource. So they, the company started finding various ways around this. Um, once they were regaining some power as the companies by doing the saying, well, you're not labor broker workers, you're outsource workers, you actually work for someone else who runs a section of the factory as a completely different company, which in reality is bullshit, but that's what they were allowed to do legally and the state was backing them. Um, companies started to regain power. So since we wrote the chapter, what companies have been doing is they've gone back to a position where they refuse to recognize the councils. Um, and then recently a debate has been taking place within the Seminar Workers Forum and they decided that they needed to try and register. So it meant that they're gonna try and actually form a trade union. The idea is to form a different type of trade union and retain that ethos of direct democracy of the forum. Um, whether that can be maintained, no one really knows, but the, the idea is to try and maintain that ethos. 
So these are kind of the massive struggles that have taken place over the last two years in South Africa. Um, I think what was really important was, just to conclude, was that this was done by workers that were seen as unorganizable, yet they organized themselves. Um, that was an amazing thing. And it showed that if you're using direct action that's well thought out, um, especially the wildcat strikes, you can win games. Um, I think what we face now is those struggles, obviously the, the ruling class has regrouped. They've tried to use different tactics to undermine those struggles. What we face now is how can you maintain those struggles going forward? Um, how do you build enough power where you can force bosses to recognize these new and different ways of organizing um, where it breaks from, from what has become a traditional union in South Africa? So even if that is under Simon Year Workers Union, uh, how do you maintain that direct democracy, that vibrancy and, and force bosses to recognize that structure you've created? Um, and that, that I think is a long-term struggle and that's a struggle that, that workers are gonna have to obviously navigate. Um, but I think it's, it showed that, that what we have and what unions have become, I mean, obviously unions have been different um, over history. You've had revolutionary unions, but what they become now is not a vehicle that's taking struggles forward. So either, yeah, workers have to find a way to, to track those struggles forward. And we had two examples here that, that really, really did that and were absolutely amazing. Um, but now we face a situation where now it has to regroup and now you have to find new ways to counter the tactics that are now coming from the employee side and, and the state. Um, and that's a long-term thing, but I think it's shown that, that there is still working class power in South Africa, that it, it, it needs to find its, its own forms and its own ways of doing things where it can recompose itself as a force that can can bring change and it can win games, but it showed it can be done. Um, the challenge, as I said, is now to find out how and a way that can sustain that over a longer period of time um, and that can really force fundamental change in South Africa, which unfortunately the official end of apartheid really did not bring. So yeah, that's the experience that we wrote about. Thank you so much, Robert and Sean, for speaking. Um, unfortunately, you can't hear anyone applaud when you're doing these online talks. Um, I'd like to open up to questions. I just noticed that Rose is here and Catherine. Do either of you have any questions that you'd like to ask our speakers? If you do, just send a little message on the chat or unmute yourself and ask the question. All right, well, I have a more broad sort of question that I'd like to ask you too. So ultimately, this research is um, working towards ending capitalism in a very sort of broader, larger sense. Um, so what I'm interested in, in is, you know, Mark Fisher talks about um, in Capital Real, Realism, quotes Zizek and Jemison that people can imagine the end of the world better than they could imagine the end of capitalism. So I'm wondering how do you think that the workers inquiry can sort of help destroy this inability to imagine an alternative to capitalism? John, do you want to Take a shot first. Uh, do you want to go first and then I'll go after? <laughs> yeah, sure. Cool. You know, I, I, I both love that quote, but I also think it it's disempowering. And I think one of the values of uh, this kind of workers inquiry, like we heard in detail from Sean, is that it demonstrates um, in, in practice that when people self-organize, things can be changed. The balance of power can be tilted in favor of those who want to reorganize society in a different way, starting in the workplace um, or the unwaged workplace for that matter. And, um, and then it becomes an example that can be emulated and becomes inspiring and that be, that that can also um, spread. I, I like to think of it as circulating. Um, you know um, what what Sean is talking about at that time. Um, this was a, the last cycle of global struggle that was happening around the, the I call it the the Great uh, Depression of of twenty eight to twenty ten. 
And you had movements that were in the streets, but also in the workplaces, in the home, in the neighborhoods that was spreading around the world, um, starting in, in with the Arab Spring. Um, and I think that those examples become something that inspires um, and gives people an idea that um, we can imagine a world beyond capitalism. Um, it's going to be a long, a long slog, a long haul, um, and there's going to be a, a, it's going to be an indirect route, um, but it provides those kind of examples that I think gives people the inspiration to, um, to keep moving it forward. Yeah, um, so, so, I mean, obviously, for me, these are, are, are struggles that are really, have been really important, um, the ones in South Africa. Um, I think what, what Robert said was key, that um, these, the, there was a lot of kind of copying of different struggles. The fact they were taking place allowed them to spread. Um, there were no hired organizers that were going from mine to mine to mine. People actually started seeing other mines doing this. Um, and it spread like wildfire. It also spread to different sectors. I didn't, we didn't cover it in the book, but there was also a massive farm worker strike, the first one in South Africa's history. Um, that also occurred at this time that it was actually directly inspired by the platinum mine worker strike. So for me, obviously, Politically, what I'm hoping for is, yes, that one day we have a revolution that gets rid of capitalism. I would argue that gets rid of the nation state. Um, but that's not going to come through, I think, an academic thinking out in isolation. I'm not saying academia and thinking out is, is not important, but it's not going to come in isolation that, I don't know, someone sits in a room in Cape Town and thinks, oh, this is a great vision, and then people will pick it up. It's going to come through struggle. Um, so for me, what I'm also inspired about um, recently is kind of the stuff that's happening in Rojava. Um, and they do have a, a vision of a different society. But what was key was that vision came out of a mass movement. Um, and without the mass movement, I don't think there will be a different society. It will only be a mass movement that brings about that society. So, so I do think, yeah, a vision of a different society is vital. But that comes through struggle, that comes through mass movement, that comes through debate. Um, so that's why I think what happened in, in 2012 when the platinum mine working sector specifically was important. That has been rolled back, so that cannot be denied, but it showed something else could be done. It showed that it was still possible to move, to build a mass movement in a condition where the working class has become more fragmented, but yet that that vehicle and those vehicles united on large sections of the working class. And, and at that moment, I think there was the potential, if that could have been maintained, that real gains could be made. Um, so yeah, um, I do think obviously a long-term vision is important, but that that only comes out of mass movements and struggle and it will obviously be different, slightly different in each context, but um, I do see those as, as embryos of a different society, even the way they're organized was on the direct democracy showed what we have in the state system is very hollow. Um, you know, having several thousand people meet at once and still be able to pull off what they pulled off. Um, we all told now that that would be chaos, yet it wasn't chaos. They, they actually pulled off one of the most amazing struggles in South Africa's history. So it showed even in a very basic level, you, you, you know, the ways that even society or the state itself is organized, how stuff that has become to replicate the state is organized, like trade unions, unfortunately, today, or most of them. Um, it need not be that way. And, and people learn through experience. And I think that experience was so important that you don't need to, to fall back on, I don't know, hoping that the state will do something that, that actually you have power as workers. Um, yeah. Great, so I'm just going to read uh, Rosa's question out here. Rosa has apologised for being late. They were coming from Northern Territory. So <clears throat> Rosa's asked, I'd be interested in how COVID might influence grassroots activity. Also, have the ways people organise amongst themselves? Well, I'd like to address that. So we've seen a, a decline uh, over recent months in the United States at least, but in the early months, 
of the pandemic, we saw just an explosion of self-organized wildcat strikes in all kinds of sectors uh, among healthcare workers, uh, what are called platform workers, or in the United States, we call them gig workers, uh, working for um, uh, Uber and Amazon and so forth. Uh, we saw walkouts in, of Amazon warehouse workers. Uh, we even saw public sector workers uh, walk out and walk out strikes. By one estimate, uh, a, a labor news source in the United States called Payday Report estimated that um, in the first couple of months, there were about 700 different wildcat strikes around the United States. Um, and they have this really great map kind of demonstrating where it all was. And one of the things that really kind of emerged there was really how um, news of one self-organized walkout seemed to have sparked and inspired others around the country to do so. But there was, an, there was another element to that that has, has really gotten very little attention. And that is most of the workers um, who were engaged in these wildcat strikes were actually in the United States, we called them essential workers. And for about eight months, every night, uh, people would go out into their yards and their patios, and they would, um, they would hoot and holler uh, at sunset, thanking all of these so-called essential workers who were dying in very large numbers, by the way, um, because they weren't able to work remotely. Um, and I think that that demonstrated really the centrality of reproductive labor, unwaged reproductive labor, and how essential it was. Um, even among workers like myself who are working remotely through these kind of telecommunication tools, that the amount of unwaged labor um, that was still being done um, was uh, really uh, triggered um, a major crisis in the United States, at least. Um, and the workers that were providing um, work that was essential to keeping people alive and treating people and, and delivering food uh, demonstrated their power and how um, really how fragile uh, the economy was. The small walkouts uh, and wildcat strikes were very, very disruptive. And the response, uh, even from a very far right government like the Trump administration, was essentially to resort to Keynesian fiscal policy and plow hundreds of billions of dollars into uh, paying uh, essentially uh, parents to stay home, for family sick leave, uh, to take care of ill family members, um, and, um, and dramatically increased unemployment payments and expanded it to cover gig workers. And so I, I think there was a direct correlation between the, the wave of wildcat strikes and the response from the state in the way that, Sean, you were just talking about in South Africa and how labor laws changed to adapt and try to, to harness and control uh, those struggles that you talked about. Um, so I think the, the pandemic in some ways um, has transformed the role of the state in, um, in trying to manage and exploit that uh, reproductive labor um, and harness it to uh, productivity. Um, yeah, so yeah, under COVID-19, uh, COVID what, what has really been happening is you've seen a, um, a massive attack by companies, but also the state on workers. Um, so um, the state has embarked on quite a hostage to austerity plan. So the, the thing that I mentioned called the CCMA, which is where workers can take cases that they've fired, that has basically been defunded to a large degree. So it's no longer functional. Um, that was, I think, a deliberate tactic by the state because there's been mass retrenchments in South Africa under COVID-19. There have been some struggles in the workplace, but um, South Africa is like quite an interesting place because sometimes the, the focus of struggle can switch. <laughs> um, the, now my, my words aren't coming here, but it can kind of, it can move to different terrains quite quickly. Um, so what has been quite interesting in here is most of what we have a 43% unemployment rate in South Africa. So large parts of the working class are unemployed. Under COVID-19, that's where struggle has suddenly shifted to. So there's been huge land occupations, struggles for housing. Um, so that's another thing that we kind of face in the context of South Africa. How do we begin to bring the struggles of the precarious workers or workers together with unemployed 
people. Um, essentially, they're one class, but how do you begin to do that? It's something that we've been battling with for, for 20 years. Um, and there are kind of signs that, that, that there are potentialities of it because there's, there's another quite interesting experiment of a farm worker union. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting union because it tries to organize quite differently as well where they've recruited people that are community members and farm workers and trying to take one struggle, even though people may be unemployed. So there are things happening under COVID-19. It's just kind of the, the sites where they're happening is switched slightly from the workplace. I think you're going to see massive struggles again, because I don't think people are going to sit back with the amount of retrenchments that are happening. Um, yeah, I think there will be eruption of struggles. It's hard to say where that will be, what sector that will be, how, what form that will take. But um, yeah, in South Africa, there's in some ways no shortage of, of protests. Um, it's about kind of transforming that into a movement that can be sustainable, that can bring systemic change. So it's not unusual that there will be strikes or, or, or protests in South Africa. It's just about how do you bring that into a movement that has progressive politics that can push for systematic change um, or systemic change. Um, so that's really what we kind of battle with in South Africa is how do you unite the fragmented working class or how do you assist the, I mean, it's not someone outside who's going to do it, but how do you assist that class to kind of make the connections with one another um, when it is fragmented, uh, how do you unify struggles and, and yeah, um, how do you maintain struggles? Um, uh, so we don't have a shortage of protests. It's just the sustaining long-term struggles is, is what we're kind of battling with under fragmented working class. Um, and under, yeah, a system of capitalism really is extremely harsh. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so... We're going to have to finish up. I apologize to the people that sent through questions that I didn't get to ask, but hopefully we can have a discussion another time once the book comes into NIBS. Um, some of you may or may not be aware, but the New International Bookshop does do monthly book clubs. And at some point this will be our book club book. Um, anyway, thank you so much to Robert and Sean for joining us. Thank you so much for staying up late or for putting your time in and joining us. Um, I'm aware that you do have to go. So thank you so much. If you have any quick closing statements. Well, I just want to wish everybody a, a happy May Day and uh, may every day be May Day. <laughs> thank you for having us. Cool. Yeah, the happy May Day to you guys. And yeah, thank you for the invite. And yeah, it was very, very cool. Thank you. <laughs>